Good morning. Welcome to uh, Physics 4C Lab. So what we'll be doing in the lab each week, we'll be coming in here, we'll be doing a set of measurements. We'll have something in mind that we want to go in and make measurements of. We'll get out the instrumentation that we're going to be using. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the method we're going to use in making those measurements. And then we'll, we'll come up with something. So for example, I guess, let's, let's look at our first week here. Uh, our first lab, uh, we're going to say is looking at index of refraction. Now we talked about that in class today, so we've introduced this idea that when light travels through different materials, uh, it's kind of a relay race of photons. So uh, the path of the light traveling through um, is not at C. It's not the same speed that you would have in a vacuum. So light passing through materials, uh, the individual photon photons of light uh, are interacting with the molecules along the way, and that interaction process slows them down. So what we would like to find out is our objective for the day is to measure the index of refraction, little n, that's the symbol we've been using, for some glass and plastic samples. So I've got those right here. Uh, here is our glass sample, and uh, hey, it looks like a triangular prism, right? Uh, kind of flattened uh, triangular prism of glass. And then we have a plastic sample also. Uh, this one's also a triangular prism, it's just, it's, it's taller, I guess. The other one was shorter or flattened. Anyway, those are the two samples that we want to work with. And we want to find out how much they slow down light. So we want to find out what their index of refraction is. Now, one of the effects that we talked about in class of this slowdown of uh, the speed of light is that uh, when light passes through materials that are transparent, uh, there's going to be an angle of refraction at that boundary. So at the boundary between the two different transparent materials, uh, there's going to be an angle at which you know the light is traveling. And uh, the angles on the two sides won't match. So if we send, for example, uh, a beam of light towards this, let's say this is our piece of glass, um, that light's going to come in. Now we're going to measure the angle of incidence relative to the perpendicular. So we, we talked about that also in class today. And um, that's how we keep track of the um, that's how we make our, our angular measurements. It's not relative to the surface, but relative to the perpendicular to the surface. So I've drawn in a perpendicular right there uh, to the surface, and I'm going to call that theta 1. Now, in our lab today, we're going to be uh, following paths of light through these materials, and we're going to need to be able to identify, hey, where's theta 1 on my diagram that I'm, I'm putting together? So anyway, we're going to end up going in and measuring theta 1. Uh, and then the light coming into the glass, passing through the glass, is not going to be at the same angle because of this slowdown effect as uh, the light interacts with the glass. Uh, it's going to be slower. And what we find is that there's a bend towards the normal. Uh, the more light slows down, the more its path will bend toward that normal line or the perpendicular line that we've drawn. So this is going to be theta 2. So I'm just trying to make sure I'm getting all my angles uh, listed correctly. So there's a refraction effect that takes place here. Now what also is going to happen is uh, when we send light through our samples, uh, the light's going to exit out the other side. At least that's how we want to align everything, is so we can see both uh, effects taking place. We're going to see the light go from air into glass, and then leaving the glass and heading back out into the air. Now on the other side, I've labeled these angles theta 3 and theta 4. One of the things we have to be really careful with is, hmm, when I look at this diagram, does theta 3 equal theta 2? And maybe I didn't draw the diagram, and it doesn't. In general, it doesn't. So um, that's not necessarily going to be the case. So you've got to keep track from your drawings. Make your drawings careful. And uh, if, you know, if two angles are not the same, make sure that they get labeled distinctly. 
So theta two and theta three are, are two different angles. We're going to have to measure each one of those separately. Now theta two and theta three are related based on the geometry of our prism. Turns out that the uh, samples we're using today have an apex angle of 60 degrees, and we'll, we'll verify that. We'll double check that with our protractors. But uh, since they're at 60 degrees, then I can work my way around these triangles and go, if that's 60, then this angle down here is going to be the supplementary angle. It's going to be 120, and then theta 2 plus theta 3. Actually, we can show that theta 2 plus theta 3 combined have to equal alpha. So theta 2 and theta 3 are going to combine to be 60 degrees. Check the geometry out. Uh, make sure that you understand how these diagrams are working. So in any case, what I can do now is I can write down um, the law of refraction. So the formula we have derived for refraction, now we've both derived it and we've shown experimentally uh, this is the way light behaves. Uh, the, the formula we're going to work from is n1 sine theta 1 equal n2 sine theta 2. Now, if I'm looking over here at material 1, material 1 is the air. And so um, the index of refraction for air is like 1.0003. And in almost all of our measurements, in almost all the calculations, the homework problems that we look at, it's so close to 1 that uh, we're just not going to keep four or five significant figures. So for, for most practical cases, that we're looking at, air can be rounded off to 1.00. So we're just going to call that 1 and kind of ignore that in our formula. Now the N2 that we're looking at, that is the N of our sample. So I'm going to say, you know, little n, that's the index of refraction that we set out to measure. And uh, so N2 in this formula is going to get replaced by N. And then when I solve for that little n, it becomes sine theta 1 over sine theta 2. So you go, okay, that's it. We just we measure theta 1 carefully. We measure theta 2 carefully. And uh, we take the sign of those. We take the, pro the, the ratio. We, we divide them. We divide those numbers. That's going to give us a value for the index of refraction. Now, when we first do a diagram like this and uh, we uh, write down the formula, um, you know, you may be wondering, you guys have some experience, you're physics 4C students. Uh, you know from, you know, labs in physics 4A and 4B, uh, you're probably wondering, hmm, is this going to be one of those really precise labs where the measurements can be made within, you know, 1 or 2 percent uh, in terms of precision? Or is it going to be one of those more difficult labs uh, to be able to get reliable numbers for? And it does turn out, I'm going to say this first lab that we're looking at, is more on the less precise side. And so to try and compensate for that, when we go in and do these measurements, uh, we'll do several of them. So we'll be making sure that we do uh, measurements of the um, theta 1s and theta 2s. We'll try at least three different values. Now there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, we want to try different values of theta 1. We don't want to use the same theta 1 every time. We want to make sure that our formula is going to work uh, regardless of what the theta 1 value is that we start with. So we want to try different values of theta 1 uh, and see what the theta 2's are and calculate our n's. And then we want to check and see if the numbers that are showing up in that column are similar to each other. Okay? Uh, we're expecting, at least the way that the formula has been derived, that the value of n that we come up with should, we should just keep getting roughly the same value of n. Now it does turn out that this lab, this particular method, is pretty sensitive to errors that we make. So we're going to have to be careful. Uh, I've got uh, you know, the, high, the, the um, instruments that we're going to be using. What I have is I have a, a wooden platform, and we'll get a close-up of this. So, we're gonna, I'm going to bring the camera in, we'll get a closer look. But here's kind of what I've set up. I've taken a piece of uh, blank paper. Um, I've put some uh, pins in to hold that in place. And I don't know if you can see this or not, but I've, I've traced carefully around the uh, edges, the perimeter of the sample. Now, I don't necessarily need the corners filled in, but I do need all of these surfaces very carefully measured such that when I take this sample and I put it in place, 
it lines right up. Those vertical edges of my sample need to be faithfully represented by the pencil lines that I've, I've drawn down below there. Because the reason why is this. Let's go back and look at the diagram. If I'm going to get a protractor, and here's my, uh, again, here's, here's the other instrumentation. I have a ruler or a straight edge. So I get that to ruler in there and start drawing these lines to make sure that I have a set of straight lines here. And then I'm going to get a protractor in there and uh, do uh, protractor measurements of that. So I've got to be able to get a protractor in. Now, if I'm looking at this protractor, I'm seeing that the angles that I'm going to draw are, are quite a ways away from the center. So uh, what I'm going to need to do is ex extend some of those lines. So again, uh, I'll be able to show more detail when we take a look at that. But um, when I'm looking at this protractor, it looks like you know I've got individual degrees of arc uh, identified uh, on my protractor. I'm going to try and measure tenths of a degree. Tenths of a degree seems pretty reasonable uh, to try for here. But um, I'm probably not going to be that accurate. So I'm already starting to see where some of these limitations are coming in from. Uh, the angles are probably only going to be measured to within an accuracy of maybe a degree. Okay. So, um, and uh, just as a reminder too, there's going to be a set of slides that goes along with this lab and with each of the labs that we look at. And I will provide everything that will be right on the board will be in those slides. And um, also I'm going to add some extra pages. So things that discuss some more of the details here. So you can refer to those. Uh, and, and maybe many of you have already looked at those for the day, and that's great. If you want to look at the slides up front to get a feel for what the labs are going to, we're going to be doing in the lab, that's, that's, a, that's a real uh, advantage. Maybe look at the slides, go back and forth between this presentation and, and those slides. Anyway, uh, I've got a measurement of the index of refraction from this surface. I've got another one over here using angles theta 3 and theta 4. Now, what we can do then is in my, uh, well, in my lab report, what I want to do is I want to put in the data tables. Now, um, I'm going to be providing um, those data tables, so that's something else to look for. Look for the data tables. Um, so I'm going to be taking the data, I'm going to be filling in the tables, and then you know I'll put that in with uh, all the information for the lab. So you'll have access. I'm going to be your lab partner, basically, is what that comes down to. So um, you guys are encouraged to work together in groups, uh, but I'm going to be the lab partner for each group, and at least for the time being, I'm going to be taking all the measurements. Uh, if you guys want to try this, some of these labs are simple enough that you can get out some stuff at home and try setting up some of these labs on your own, that, that's you know, totally, totally fine. Um, let's see, here's the data table. So what we said is that there's going to be some direct measurements. Those direct measurements are going to be made using my ruler and my protractor, along with my careful placement of my sample. So, you know, i got to get the uh, line drawn reliably. And then I got to get the uh, straight edge and the um, protractor working in a way where I can get accurate. You know, if I'm accurate to a, a degree, I'm going to feel pretty good about this. But, but, but again, we'll see how this plays out. So I'm going to get multiple measurements. So we're going to check these values over a range of different data ones and a range of different data threes. I'm going to get some number of measurements, and then we can do averaging. Uh, and the averaging will. Um, you know, the averaging will tell us what our reported overall average is for that day's um, sample. All right, so uh, now what we've just set up and talked about here, uh, the details, apply to what I'm going to call the direct method. We actually have two different methods that we're going to use for the day. Um, and. Um, in the direct method, we're just going to go in with the protractors, measure theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, theta 4, uh, calculate what the values of n are, and then we're going to average over those and report. Okay. Um, 
There's a second method that we want to look at today. So we're going to take both samples and use both methods. Um, the second method is called the me method of minimum deflection. Now, what deflection is defined as is, let's say that we have a, a path of light. So here's the path of light coming up to that first edge, and then it refracts, and then it passes through the glass, and then it refracts again on the way out. So light comes in, refraction, refraction. During that entire process, uh, compared with the path of the light approaching the glass, compared with the path of the light leaving the glass, what's the angle of deflection? So I, I used a little Greek delta, because delta sounds like deflection. Uh, so uh, how much tonal deflection took place? Now, the advantage of this method of minimum deflection is that I, I don't have to draw the perpendiculars. Uh, I don't have to go in and measure theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, theta 4. Uh, I measure two angles. Uh, one of those angles is the apex angle. Once I've measured that, that's done, right? So once I measure the apex angle, that's not going to change. That's the same value each time. And I think I suggested earlier that our apex angle is going to be at 60 degrees. So, uh, and we'll go in, we'll, we'll double check that. But uh, that's going to be at 60 degrees, so this column just stays the same. So the only thing I really have to measure that's different from one run to the next is delta. And uh, again, what delta is, is what's called the minimum uh, angle of deflection. So it, it works this way. I'm going to use this other sample. I'll use this uh, narrower sample here. What happens is when I've got this set up, and I have the light passing through, refracting a couple times, as I rotate, I'm going to rotate my sample. Now this is all sitting down on a plate, so um, I'm just going to have this sitting here. I'm going to have a laser set up. The laser is going to provide the light coming in for the second method, not for the first. We'll see how the first works. It's, it's a little different. But there's going to be laser light coming in. Laser light is going to pass through my sample. As I rotate the sample back and forth, what I'll see is that this value of delta is changing. Now there's going to be a point at which this hits the minimum value. And I can't get it to go any, small, any smaller. It turns out that, well, it turns out, I'll, I'll put the derivation into the notes for the lab so you guys can see the derivation of this. But it turns out that the total deflection that takes place minimizes when theta 2 equals theta 3. Now, we don't have to go in and measure those, but what's happening is, as I rotate this back and forth, I'm going to pass through that point where the deflection angle is the least. Um, and so I just have to write that one angle down. And then I have to uh, plug everything into this formula. And again, the derivation of that will be in the notes. So you guys will get a chance to see that uh, derivation, where it comes from. All right, and then that's the lab for the day. So there's the direct method. There is the um, method of minimum deflection. Uh, I'm going to follow up here with another, um, I'm going to do one more video here showing kind of the close-up detail of these two methods, but this is kind of how it works. Now, a couple things to be aware of when you're carrying out this lab. One of them is this. We've drawn this really nice path of the light refracting and refracting, but that's not the only possible path that the light can take. If you think back to uh, you know, chapter 32, the discussion on refraction in, in lecture, um, what's going to happen at that first surface is some of the light's going to reflect right back out. Now, that's not a big deal, because we're not going to get confused by light reflecting over here. Um, that turns out not to be uh, a problem for us. What does turn out to be a problem for us is this. Um, when the light goes through the glass, and it reaches this surface, some of the light exits back out into the air, but some of it internally reflects. It reflects within the glass itself. And that creates a path of light going back through this surface and exits on this side. So we're going to have to watch for that. We're going to have to make sure that when we do the setup, our setup looks kind of like this picture that we've got drawn here. Uh, if it, it, what we're looking for are two paths of light that are bent away 
from the apex angle between them. If that's the case, then we've got the correct two paths. If we've got a path of light that's coming out on this side, what that will look like to us is that the two lights are bent towards the apex between them. And that's an indication to us that we we're following the wrong path of light. So that's, that's not the one we're after. We want the one that looks like this. Now, uh, as long as I've got everything here, uh, let me let me let me kind of indicate what's going on. I've got more of these pins, so I've got more of these pins going on. And what I'm going to do is, uh, in this first method, I'm not using a laser as a light source. I'm just following the path of light, just looking at it using my eyes. And so what I can do is I'm going to get a couple of pins. So pin A, let's say, and pin B. And I'm going to place those into um, that wooden platform that I'm using. I'm going to get a couple of pins placed here. And then I'm going to walk over to this other surface and I'm going to look for the light that's exiting. Specifically, I'm going to look for the image of those two pins. So when I look through the glass uh, at this particular angle, when I've found the correct angle, what's going to happen is these two pins are going to look like they're lined up. Now, you guys have seen this effect, right, with refraction. You've seen like an aquarium. If you walked around in an aquarium with some tropical fish swimming around inside, you notice that as you walk back and forth, objects don't see, they seem to, to shift quickly from one place to another. And that's this effect of refraction. The light path is being bent. And so when I'm looking through this glass, you know, I can look up above the glass and see where those two pins are. But when I look down in the glass, the two pins look like they're lined up. So what looks like to me, two pins that aren't lined up when I'm not looking through the glass, then when I look through the glass, their images line right up with each other. That's the path I'm after. And so what I can do at that point is I can put in two more pins. So I'm going to label these as A, B, C, and D. And so when I'm done with this particular setup, so I guess we're back on method one, really. When I'm back here on method one, putting in these pins, a, B, C, and D. When I look through the glass, I can see if I look right along C and D, A and B line right up with it. Okay. And when we've got all four of those pins lined right up, we've identified the path of the light on each side of the sample. That's what we're looking for. Uh, that's what's going to provide us um, with the angles. So once we've identified those pins, then what we can do, or those, those paths, then what we can do is we can remove the sample, take that out. Uh, we can get some little pencil marks where the pins were located, pull the pins out. And then we're off to a, a geometry problem or a, a you know, uh, then we can start getting out our, our um, straight edge and getting out our protractor and start doing all the measurements that we want to do. Now, since I'm collecting the data, um, I am... Also, well, I'm going to be making these drawings. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to be making these drawings and I'm going to use these drawings to come up with the angles that are going to go into my data tables. Okay. So that's kind of the overview. That's method one. This is method two. Uh, again, I'll be doing a close-up uh, where we can go in and, and see more of the details in these two methods. All right, since this is our first lab of Physics 4C, once again, welcome. Uh, let's talk a little bit about lab reports for the semester. So if you guys were back in my Physics 4A, 4B classes, then you're probably already kind of familiar with this um, approach. Um, each week, there's going to be a topic, a title to our labs, and then we're going to have an objective. So, what we want to have in mind here is we're out to make measurements. Uh, you know, we want to think of this as, I don't know, we're out working for some, some company and we're manufacturing this material 
and we want to find out what the optical properties are, and someone assigns you and says, hey, go find out what the index of refraction is for this plastic or this glass that we've just manufactured. Um, and so this would be you going in and, and finding out these two different methods, uh, setting them up, going in and doing the measurements. So the idea is, this is it, this is our objective, is to get the best possible, most accurate measurements of the index roof of refraction for the uh, samples we've been assigned. Okay, that's what our um, objective is. Now in the lab reports, uh, what I want you guys to start off with is the title and the objective. And that shouldn't be too difficult because we're going to present that each week in lab. So every time we come into lab, uh, we're going to have you know, a set of notes here. We're going to have things written up here. This is what we're setting out to do. Um, and um, what we want to do after the So th this is what we're going to be doing. The title objective is going to show that. And then we want to follow that up with some results tables. So uh, in the notes for the lab, I'll provide some examples of what uh, data tables might look like. Uh, so, oh, I'm sorry, results tables. So the results tables are kind of saying, what's the final result that we've ended up with? So in today's lab, the results table are going to have our values of n. And then it'll have some overall average value of n. Because, you know, if, you're, if you've been set off, if this is your assignment, uh, is, to come, is to make measurements of this new plastic or uh, glass sample that you've manufactured, then uh, when you bring in your results, you want to say, based on everything that we did, you know, we did the measurements as carefully as we could, based on everything that we looked at, this is what we think are the values. And so that's what your results table should be based on. Now, uh, it's always good to follow up with just a few comments. So uh, with the, the results table for today's labs, um, you might comment on, I don't know, if, if, let's say you do all six measurements and they all line up within 5% of each other. You could comment on that. You could say everything came within 5%. What if they don't? What if you do the measurements and you find that you're getting you know, wildly varying numbers? You may want to go back and do more measurements. Um, you, may have to, you may be left uh, reporting that. <clears throat> you may be left reporting that we did a lot of measurements, uh, we were as careful as we could, we, we, we still ended up with measurements that seemed to uh, vary quite a bit. So you could acknowledge to the reader uh, of your lab report that um, you feel like there's still, there were some real limitations in the, uh, in the measurements that were made. So lab reports, timeline objective, results table, data table. Now, once you've told the reader, which I guess in most cases is going to be me, once you've told the reader of your lab report what your results are, then you're going to go back and show the data tables uh, along with formulas. So it's good to show formulas. You want to put some diagrams in there. I think diagrams are great. So, uh, you know, maybe some of these diagrams, the, uh, the formulas, and the tables. Now, the one thing that I don't require is I don't require you guys to do a lot of detail on the laboratory setup. So you don't have to write a couple pages saying how everything was, um, was set up. Uh, we're going to assume that um, you know, we all know how uh, we derived these formulas or how we ended up using these formulas. If I do expect something in you know, more detail, I'll let you guys know in future labs. But, um, you're fine just writing these formulas down for the day. Uh, so data tables. Now the other item we want to have in the lab reports is we want to have limitations. Now what limitations are is it's the possibility of, you know, we made errors or uh, there were errors that came in. I guess I don't want to say we made errors. Um, let's say that there are errors in the measurements that were made. I'm trying to make this intransitive. Um, or Anyway, what I want to make this into is, um, first of all, taking a look at the measuring devices. So based on the measuring devices that we've worked with, there's always going to be limitations inherent in the measuring device. So uh, when we pick up a measuring device, like a uh, protractor, for example, you know, kind of the best we could hope to do might be a tenth of a degree. So there's already uh, an inherent uh, limitation 
built into that measuring device. And then there's going to be a limitation as to uh, how reliably that pencil mark is going to match up with the side of the, um, of the sample. So those are the kind of things, things that were done as direct measurements. And I, I think I went back and uh, I didn't get this one listed. This is also a direct measurement here uh, with this delta. Let me add that in. So we're going to go back to our data tables and pay close attention to the direct measurements that we've made. So anything that's a direct measurement, we want to think in terms of what was the measuring device? What was the instrument used in making that measurement? Because we want to report that uh, in terms of, uh, of measuring devices. Now the other thing are, are assumptions. So sometimes in, um, in some of these labs, we're going to make assumptions about what, what the behavior is of different materials. Uh, and so sometimes, um, uh, though, well, when those do come up, uh, we're going to need to uh, keep track of those also. All right, so the lab reports, title and objective, results table, data tables, limitations. Think of those as kind of the big four. Uh, those are the items, and it's going to be the same every week. And um, I will very likely provide some examples of what some of this looks like uh, with the notes for the lab. I mean, everything's in Canvas, right? So uh, the way I've got Canvas set up right now, and I hope this doesn't change, um, but uh, the way I'm planning on setting up Canvas is if you, when you go into the modules, scroll all the way down to the lower part. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put all the lectures, uh, kind of a schedule of lectures and midterms and final exams, and then uh, lower if you scroll farther down, then you'll run into all the labs. And for each lab, there's going to be a module and uh, all of the resources that you can work from for that particular lab are going to be included in that particular module. All right, so I'm going to stop there with the board work, and uh, let's take a look at some of the more details. Uh, let's look at a close-up of some of the uh, equipment we're going to be using. All right, here is the close-up for the uh, method number one looking at the index of refraction. So what I've got here is, uh, here's my piece of paper. Uh, I've attached that at the corner so it's not sliding back and forth. I've got my sample. I placed that onto the paper. And what I've already done is I've identified where the edges are for that sample. Now I've got to put the sample back in place. I want to make sure that this sample now lines right up with those pencil marks. I don't want the pencil marks on the outside. I want it right along so there's a, an alignment between them. Okay, now what I did is I put a couple of pins in on one side. I want to check and see if this is going to work. Uh, remember, there was a diagram on the board. We called these pins A and B. They were going to define the path uh, that I was looking at on the way in. And then what I have to do is I have to bring this um, I'm going to bring it to the edge of the table, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to look right through here and try and find a, uh, oh, there they are. So I can look through the glass, because I didn't bring it so much to the edge. I'm going to look right through the glass and then see where those two paths line up. Now, uh, I want to get a good measurement of this, so uh, let me grab my glasses. I'm going to grab a couple of lenses that I carry around with me. And, uh, oh yeah, that's going to work better. So, uh, now I can see those two paths. And they line up. Oh, no. Okay, back to here. I've got that alignment set up. I don't want to get the sample again. And so I am going to measure these. So I want them to line up. Now there is one of the points that lines up. I'm going to put pin C in, and I'm going to grab pin D. And 
what I have now. And I'm going to put this pin a little ways out. You know, if I can get more separation between the pin placement, uh, that's going to uh, minimize the um, uncertainty in my measurements. Okay, so what's happening is that when I look through the glass from this direction at the light coming through these two pins, what I see is it lines up. So what I can do now is this. What I can do now is I can identify the pin here, the pin here. Okay, I'm going to take those out. And uh, I'm actually going to lift this up also, lift up my sample. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my straight edge and follow that path. Okay. That was easy enough to do. I could see where the pin marks were. So this path is coming in right to here. Okay. Now, that junction point, the point where that path hits the edge, that's important. Uh, I'm hoping I was careful enough that everything's going to line up. I'm going to take these two out. This is the path of the light on the opposite side. So what I've got then is... Again, I want to get this lined right up. All right, so that looks pretty good. What I've done is I've identified the path the light's taking on both sides. Then what I can do is I can uh, connect those two points. So what I'll do is I'll connect the points at the surfaces and uh, indicate where I believe the light to be traveling through the sample. Okay. All right. That's it. That's my picture that I've come up with uh, for this particular path. Now what I could do is I could come in and I could draw some perpendiculars. So, uh, and at this point I can kind of let go of everything else. I don't have to hold everything in place anymore. Uh, now that I have all the drawing information there. What I can do is I can come in and do uh, some perpendiculars. So my ruler actually has a place on it where I can line things up at 90 degrees. So I'm going to put that one at 90, put this one at 90. All right. There it is, there is my drawing for this particular run. Now I've got theta 1 there, I've got theta 2 there, I've got theta 3, I've got theta 4. Now there's a couple of options here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and label these, so let me, let me do that. I'm going to say this is theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, and theta 4. Okay. Those are all the angles. Now I could measure those angles, or I could measure their complementary ones too. Notice that every one of these angles uh, is going to have a complementary angle right next to it that could be measured, and maybe it could be measured more accurately. Um, so anyway, uh, that's an example of what uh, one of these measurements is going to look like. Now, I'm going to use this to fill in my uh, my table. Now notice that in order to use my protractor, I am going to have to extend these lines. So I'm going to take some of these lines and I'm going to extend them farther out, making sure that I'm maintaining alignment with my data points. Okay, so I'm going to get theta 1 from this. I'm going to take my protractor. Uh, I'm going to center it. You guys all know how to center a protractor, right? Find the center of, of um, the angular measurement on the protractor. This one's, yeah, I like this one. Okay, and then I'm going to measure, and I'm going to pull this around to zero. So I'm going to line this up with uh, the zero point on here. And when I come out to this mark, uh, this is coming in at 57. I'm going to go ahead and write this on here. Uh, I'm just coming in at 57.0.
Okay. And, and then I'm going to continue. You guys can, can kind of see how that works. So uh, 57.0 degrees for theta 1 for this particular method. All right. Okay. Now that's method 1. Let's take a look at method 2 and see how that compares. Now, we said that with method two, let me, uh, let me pause right there and make sure that you guys can see all of this. So let me take a look and see what room we have to work with. Okay, I'm gonna bring the laser out here. Uh, I'm gonna use the platform again. Uh, for this particular, uh, I'm gonna grab another, let me grab another blank sheet of paper. So let me find, a blank piece of paper that I can use. And uh, what I'm going to do first of all is I turn on my laser. And let me do this. I think this might help. Let me angle the laser a little bit so that you guys can see what's going on here. What I've got is I've got a screen so you can see that the laser uh, light is pretty collimated. It's, uh, it's a pretty narrow beam here. Yeah, this, this might just work. Uh, so here's the laser light headed in that direction. Now I'm going to give myself a little bit more space and turn this platform around. And what I'm going to do this time, kind of the same as what I did before, is uh, I'm going to anchor this sheet of paper in place. I'll put some pins in around the corners. So remember, we're on method B now. I don't want the paper shifting. The platform's pretty heavy, so that's going to hold things in place pretty well. What I'm going to do first of all is identify the path. I'm trying to keep these as vertical as possible, right there. So that is the path of light that the laser is following. I have to pull the pin to the side. <clears throat> and then here's a second path, right there. Okay. A second point along the path. All right, so what those two pins represent, you can still see the laser light because the pins are, are pushed to the side a little bit. What those two represent <coughs> is a path the light's taking uh, from the laser out to the screen. So that's with nothing in place. Uh, and I, I, can get a, I can get a line drawn along that path. So let me do that. I could do this afterwards, too. So I may be, I don't think I, I, I bumped anything. So there's a path that the light's currently taking. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of my samples, I'm going to put it in here, and I'm going to imagine that picture from the board. So I'm going to imagine Now what the picture from the board was showing is if I can get the light to come in along here, I'm looking for light coming out this side. Light comes in, refraction, refraction. I'm looking, for, oh, there it is. So that was where the light used to come, but because of the two refractions, it's now coming to this location. So right now, I, I can see I have a deflection taking place, and the deflection is headed out this direction. Uh, what I want to do, I'm going to set the screen back a little ways. Maybe I'll set it right here. I'm going to take this one pin out because it's kind of in the way. I'm going to set the uh, screen right here. Now what I want to see is what happens to my angle of deflection as I rotate. Now see how the angle of deflection is getting bigger? I want to rotate this until that angle minimizes. Now I kept rotating and what happened was it minimized for a while and then I reached a minimum value and as I continued to rotate it got bigger. So again it's that point where theta 2 equals theta 3 that we talked about. And it's happening right there. That's where it minimizes. So that looks like the minimum amount I'm going to get. 
Now what I want to do is I want to find out where that path of light is. So I'm going to get these pins once again. I'm going to get a pin here. And um, get one more pin closer in. Okay. So. Uh, and that's not quite vertical. I want to get a better placement on that. Okay, that looks better. So uh, now what I can do is I've got these two pins, which now represent the path of the light, uh, of the refracted light coming out from the prism. And so what I'll do now is I, let me, uh, I got a couple pin marks here. I got to make sure it's the right one. So it's this one and this one. And I guess I can move that to screen. And I'll get mine, I can move up my sample. And I'm going to uh, take those two marks. There. So what I've done now is my, my sample was in here somewhere. And this was the original path of the laser light uh, across the top of the paper. And then when I went through the sample, this was the total effect. Now that's both refractions combined, but the angle that we want this angle right here. That is my angle delta. So that's the angle delta that we were hoping to be able to measure. So I can go and I can get my protractor out and I can get a measurement on that angle. Let me do that. So I'm going to get this thing centered again. And uh, I guess I. I will flip it around here. I'm going to start at zero rather than 180. Zero's an easier reference to work from. Okay, I want to center that. Well, that looks good. It's right on the zero. Uh, this is coming in. It's just past 38 degrees. So I'm going to call that 38.1. All right, so... I'm going, to go in, I'm going to go in and uh, write these in my data table and then carry out some calculations and uh, see what I've got. But now what I've got is I got a sheet of paper that has my measurements from the method of least, or the, I'm sorry, the method of minimum deflection, least deflection, same thing, I guess. And then I've got my samples um, from, the, um, from the direct method. All right, so I think we've got that's basically it. That's uh, all the measurements that um, we're going to need. So I'm going to make a bunch of these measurements because um, I'm your lab partner. And you guys can uh, take a look at these. Um, and if, you, you know, if you've got a protractor at home, you could check some of these. I think I'm going to try and post all of these on Canvas. And you guys can take a look at the, the measurements. In fact, what I probably should do uh, is uh, just get the drawing set up, and then I could leave it to you guys at home. Ooh, does everybody have a protractor? That's a, that's a basic household item, right? Anyway, uh, take a look at the uh, data for the lab and uh, see, what, uh, see what we have in there. All right, so uh, again, I think this is going to wrap stuff up for the videos. Um, welcome to Physics 4C Lab. I hope this is kind of an interesting lab to start off with.